Um, I want to take a moment first to remember Gordon Lightfoot, one of Canada's greatest songwriters uh, and just an extraordinary Canadian icon. Uh, he loved this country with an incredible deep passion uh, and uh, was extraordinarily humble about it as well. I remember um, spending a little time with him a few years ago when he was playing for Canada's 150 on, uh, on Parliament Hill and was touched by his thoughtful grace and generosity. It was, uh, it was really sad news to wake up to this morning. Um, je veux juste prendre un moment pour uh, me souvenir de Gordon Lightfoot, qui était un grand, grand chansonnier canadien, qui aimait ce pays avec uh, tout ce qu'il avait et s'est dévoué uh, aux, uh, aux Canadiens et a raconté uh, nos histoires. J'aimerais savoir, M. Trudeau, à quel moment vous avez été mis au courant que la famille de Michael Chun était victime de menaces? Comme j'ai dit hier, euh, j'ai demandé à, à nos services de renseignement et à la greffière et à la fonction publique euh, de regarder en détail euh, tout ce qui entoure euh, ces, ces rapports qui ont été publiés hier. Euh, mais je peux dire que euh, c'est absolument inacceptable que euh, quelques députés ou sa famille euh, soient euh, potentiellement euh, menacés. Euh, et euh, comme j'ai aussi dit hier, euh, en aucune situation est-ce qu'on aurait bloqué euh, la les services de renseignement d'informer quelqu'un. Les inondations au Québec, comment vous réagissez à ce qui se passe actuellement et est-ce que le Québec a demandé de l'aide fédérale et de vous disposer à aider en cas de besoin? Évidemment, on va être là pour aider euh, s'il y a une demande. Euh, certainement, euh, c'est des inondations encore euh, très graves qu'on est en train de voir cette année. Euh, on est là pour aider. D'ailleurs, euh, malheureusement, on est en train d'aider dans la recherche pour euh, les, deux, euh, les deux premiers répondants euh, euh, qu'on entend qui ont euh, peut-être été emportés, euh, mais euh, pour euh, de l'aide pour les inondations, euh, on est là pour aider. Michael Chong, Michael Chong, Michael Chong, Michael Chong, Michael And then again, he is accused of betraying them and lying to them. Why promise a mother who lost her daughter to gun violence that you will do exactly what they're asking only to not do it months later? Well, first, uh, I have met uh, with uh, those mothers. I've met with the families of victims as well as survivors, not only from Palais de Souvienne, but uh, with other organizations right across uh, the country. And as I said to you yesterday, Marika, You know, I have nothing but uh, the utmost uh, respect and empathy um, for people who have uh, suffered um, the trauma and uh, the grief and the loss as a result of gun violence. And it is because of their advocacy, uh, much of which is reflected in the proposals that we put forward yesterday to strengthen Bill C-21, um, that I think will allow us to take positive action against AR-15 style firearms, which have no place in our communities, and keep our community safe. And in concrete terms, what I'm talking about is the strengthened technical definition. So these, these are ideas It's that we're putting It's actually watered down. It only applies to future guns not on the market. Tell me how it shows respect for them by canceling their briefing in advance of yesterday. I, I, I would say respectfully that um, if you look at the amendment, that sets out the technical definition, that it um, respects the language that was put forward by the Mass Casualty Commission final report. And so this also has to be looked at cumulatively with the fact that the order in council from 2020 will remain in place. Initially banned 1,500 models, is now up to 2,000 models. That will continue to apply. But how, And how, there's, how, how, how so, do you, that's not so, how do you reconcile, how do you reconcile the fact that you say that things are getting tougher when in fact police of Souviens who are defending those victims are saying no, there's lots of loopholes in your approach and it will not change the situation. Okay. First of all, I can't answer the question when you're all uh, saying it at once. I want to come back to what I was uh, answering to Marika and then I will, I will come, back, uh, come back to you. But you have to take a look at how you, like the problem that we're trying to solve here. And the problem that we are trying to solve is getting AR-15 style firearms out of our communities. And how we have done that to date is by putting in place an order in council that is now up to banning 2,000 models. 
by putting forward a technical definition that lists the language out of the Mass Casualty Commission. Yes, that will apply going forward. And with regards to the existing market, there are two really concrete things that we are doing. Um, one is we are going to take action in the very short term on large capacity magazines. That renders um, the question of you know, what models um, less relevant because that is the most essential ingredient of what turns a gun into a mass shooter. So just, yeah, but it will still be of equal force and effect. And I would just point out... The argument for legalizing the stuff was that a future government can change it. Yeah. And now it's through regulation. It's exactly counter to your argument from six months ago. Respectfully, it's not. Marika, I'm going to encourage you to read very carefully both the original bill as well as our commitments going forward. The original bill makes it clear that if we classify firearms, that a future government will not be able to de- declassify or lower the classification through regulatory instruments like an order in council. That provision is in the law. That was an idea that came from Pauli Sousouvienne, as did the idea around large capacity magazines, as did the idea of putting forward a technical definition. This shows that we are listening. And look, again, I respect the fact that they want to push this government to go as far as we possibly can. We have gone further than any government in the history of this country when it comes to tackling the issue around uh, AR-15-style firearms, and we'll continue to work not only with Policy Souvienne, but with other groups who have been very supportive, like, for example, Docs for Gun Control, like, for example, the Coalition for Gun Control. You know, Wendy Kukir yesterday was on the record as saying, Look, this is good legislation. It will take us in the right direction. And so we've got to work with a broad range of Canadians who are providing concrete ideas to the government and which we are incorporating. And we have worked also as well with parliamentarians. You know, I am cautiously optimistic that with the support of the NDP and the Bloc, that these proposals are going to become law. And by doing so, we'll save lives. One of the ways that we can do that is by setting, uh, uh, re-establishing, I beg your pardon, this advisory committee who are going to both take a look at existing models, which was the question that was posed earlier, so that we can get advice on that and applying the technical definition. But obviously, if the market tries to backdoor the new technical definition where we're raising the bar, um, then we can revisit that question then. But the, I, but, but the goal is to make sure that we are, as I said yesterday, shrinking the ground between, uh, I beg your pardon, shrinking the ground underneath criminals' feet who may try to use uh, an AR-15 style gun to commit a mass shooting. That, 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 that committee that had its own problems in the last few years. Someone's left because they, it wasn't sort of, they weren't living with the committee and the government weren't living up to what it had right. promised. Why should we have faith in what they should, why should they have faith that that committee will actually work this time? Look, you're right. There have been challenges in the past. If, and if I'm being um, very candid with you, I think that the, the entire debate and dialogue around guns and firearms regulation has become more toxic and more polarizing. And I spoke to this as well. So uh, making sure that we base our debate on facts and not on fear has got to be one of the main objectives uh, of this committee. And I think if we consult and we engage in the representation of this committee, make sure that different perspectives are reflected on this committee, take the politics out of it, um, assure everybody that this is not a partisan exercise, this is not about scoring political points, it's rather about getting the laws right and eliminating completely any possibility for an AR-15 style gun from being in our communities, then it will serve an important function. That's about, that's why we're reestablishing it. You're talking about a technical you definition. Okay. Let's go here. Et puis, et puis, merci. So you're talking about a technical definition. How right. do these amendments actually define assault style rifles or assault rifles? So it will be a, a firearm that is not a handgun that has the capacity to discharge in a semi-automatic capacity center fire ammunition that was designed with a magazine with six or more rounds. 
That is a, like not a definition that the government has just uh, invented out of thin air, but rather uh, uh, by consulting extensively with law enforcement who support it, uh, with advocacy groups who support it, um, not just Policy Suvien, but other, uh, other groups, and it, that builds on the language that was put forward in the Mass Casualty Commission. So if I, I, you know, as a lawmaker in this space, um, we have a very solid foundation on which we can say this policy, when added to the existing order in council and the action we're going to take on large capacity magazines, provides a very robust and strong and comprehensive ban on AR-15 style firearms. We, we. Oui, je comprends. Merci. D'abord, j'ai beaucoup de respect pour uh, le leadership de, de Paul Sussuvien uh, et je comprends pourquoi il continuait de nous pousser uh, dans une direction qui qui, qui est là pour aller plus loin sur la question des, des armes d'assaut. Mais ça, c'est la raison que hier, j'avais introduit, déposé des, des propositions avec une définition technique qui est basée sur le, le langue et les recommandations de la Commission de perte massive. Donc, ce n'est pas arbitraire, c'est une proposition qui est basée sur le conseil des experts indépendants non-partisans. Sur la question comment on peut passer cette uh, proposition en, 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 en rigueur, Uh, oui, c'est vrai. Il faut que dans un Parlement minoritaire, que le gouvernement travaille ensemble avec pas seulement l'MPD, mais uh, aussi le Bloc. Et dans cet espace-là, uh, la dernière année, il y a une opportunité pour le Bloc et l'MPD pour uh, nous appu appuyons le, la proposition qui existe à l'attente, mais l'appui n'était pas là. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes dans une meilleure place parce que nous avons engagé avec eux, parce que nous avons Uh, des discussions qui sont tellement constructives sur la question uh, comment on peut faire cet important travail. What Donc, about, what about the, the Senate, though? Uh, were you concerned because people are saying that you had the uh, the approval, the, the backing of the Bloc Québécois, you didn't really need the NDP. Was the Senate um, uh, a key component of of your thinking? Did, did you fear that it would not go through the Senate in the original form of the reform? Well, I think it's a good uh, question uh, because you're right, eventually, uh, and hopefully in the very short term, we are going to be able to take um, this law to the Senate, and I appreciate your optimism. Uh, I try to be optimistic about that, too. But no, I mean, my, my central focus right now was uh, to engage Canadians on how we can strengthen the definition against AR-15-style farms. I think we've done that. No, but my but question is, did you check with the Senate if you think you're going to have approval for this bill? Like you, you I, consult, I consult with uh, our Senate leadership all the time. Um, and we um, are working. What they say? They say they're very much looking forward to so receiving. To, well, look, uh, I think that they will see that the work that we have done only makes the original bill, Bill C-21, which includes uh, a national handgun freeze, which includes all the tools that we had to strengthen um, law enforcement against uh, organized criminals, which, you know, hopefully we're going to be able to get a red flag. Sorry, I was just... And having a new definition that applied to current guns... I understand. To, ha to having no additional ban on assault no, cell weapons. I, You're calling it an assault cell weapon ban on future guns, guns I, that don't exist. No, respectfully, uh, Marika, I disagree, and I'm going to encourage you to read more carefully on um, the language that we have not only in Bill C-21, uh, but in the propositions that we put forward, as well as existing law. And when you take all of those things, um, this is very strong and comprehensive. And with regards to your question about the Senate, um, look, yes, I engage with Senate leadership. Uh, I don't want to put the buggy before the horse. I've got to get this bill out of the House of Commons. And in order to do that, I need to work with um, at least one, but ideally two opposition parties. I'll just say, you know, you're absolutely right to press me on details. But I also think it's important that you put questions to the Conservatives who are really in a box on this issue, who have no ideas, who only come out with tough talk and slogans, 
but who at the end of the day only propose making AR-15 legal again, AR-15 style firearms legal again. And that is the contrast. Like the vision that we are putting forward is to get these types of guns which were designed for a battlefield out of our communities. It's only the Conservatives in this Parliament who propose to loosen and weaken gun controls and that open up the possibility and open up the possibility to making AR-15s legal again. So uh, she, she declared it. Overall, are you expecting a different response on the gun bill from last time? Uh, well, first, I think f from now and going back a couple months, Minister Menachino has been out on the road speaking specifically to Indigenous groups about um, about their rights. Uh, I think what's I think misunderstood in the general public is Indigenous people do have a right right to hunt and harvest, not necessarily a constitutional right to a specific type of weapon. And when you look at some of their uh, livelihoods being threatened by, um, by a piece of legislation that, that would affect them potentially uh, without knowing the details, I think that's very alarming. And so uh, Minister Menachino has heard them over the last few months. Uh, there was an exception in the order in council that existed, and it was one that gave them some comfort. I think at the end of the day, there may be a discussion as to whether one particular weapon does fall within the ambit of the exception and, um, and, and one that would affect Indigenous persons' right to hunt and harvest. So that'll be the challenge going down the road from a practical perspective, but I think this will, this will, uh, this will answer a number of the calls of the broader Indigenous groups to, to respect Indigenous rights. So I'm clear. So the similar, I guess, to the OIC from May 2020, I think it was, um, the the new amendments say, have a specific clause saying this doesn't impact Indigenous treaty rights. So is, is that the part that you think allays concerns that the Indigenous community had? And are you also saying at the same time that actually you don't have a right to a specific gun and so this could still become a problem in the future? Well, absolutely. I think the devil will be in the details. Uh, the, the right to hunt isn't, uh, isn't, isn't embodied in any particular uh, model or model number, and I think that is, that is where a number of the challenges are. I think when you look at the list of those that, and particularly I think about Indigenous women's advocacy groups that want specific types of weapons that have been used to kill women, uh, and Indigenous women in particular, they want them banned. Uh, you do have um, elements of friction there and elements that we are trying to uh, to address by, by banning specific weapons. And I think that is, that's the challenge. Uh, but going in with a piece of legislation where Indigenous peoples do not feel that they've been properly consulted with in the first place is really a challenge both for our government but both especially for the rights holders themselves who, uh, who have a way of life that they want respected. Um, elements of this can be also addressed in, in the buyback where there may be an, a weapon that is deemed to be uh, no longer authorized where they can get a, a substitute weapon that is, uh, a that, that is a little more acceptable for and, and fully replaceable for what they intend to do and, and the purpose it's intended to do. Les groupes de femmes se sentent abandonnés, policiers se souviennent par exemple. Les avez-vous laissé tomber alors qu'ils pensaient que les libéraux allaient bannir les armes qu'elles ont, qu ont demandé à Tadanir? Ben, écoutez, c'est... La loi elle-même vise à éliminer l'accès ou à diminuer l'accès euh, et diminuer le volume, euh, ce que la loi fait. Euh, évidemment, il y a des défis avec toutes les organisations. Euh, on peut avoir des réflexions euh, au niveau de la société pour savoir est-ce que là, est-ce que c'est là où on en est, est-ce qu'on est là comme pays pour pouvoir tout bannir, euh, ce, qui a, ce qui avait été demandé. Évidemment, il y a eu lieu d'avoir des compromis euh, avec, euh, avec le MPD, entre autres. Et c'est là où on est rendu, mais soyez sûr que ça, c'est une loi qui va faire et va accomplir les deux objectifs, c'est-à-dire euh, réduire le volume et réduire significativement l'accessibilité. La, vous avez parlé de compromis pour le NPD, mais le policier se souvient, vous accuse d'avoir dilué les mesures? Bonjour, M. Rodriguez. Bonjour, comment ça va? Ça va bien, vous? Bien, merci. Vous réagissez comment, par exemple, la police se souvient qui se sent trahie, euh, en colère, qui pensait vraiment que les libéraux allaient aller de l'avant avec un, un projet de loi, des amendements qui allaient faire en sorte de bannir les armes les plus dangereuses? Elles ont dit que Justin Trudeau les a regardées dans les yeux en disant « on va le faire », puis c'est pas ce qui s'est passé. C'est un projet de loi qui, qui va extrêmement loin. Tout d'abord, il faut se rappeler que c'est un projet de loi qui vient complètement geler le marché des armes de poing, donc il ne serait plus possible de vendre, transférer, céder des armes de poing. Euh, deuxièmement, il vient éliminer euh, des armes d'assaut à, à produire. Donc, c'est un projet de loi qui, qui va extrêmement loin, qui, et il faut qu'il soit aussi faisable. 
C'est-à-dire qu'il faut avoir l'appui nécessaire en Chambre pour le faire adopter. Donc, un projet de loi imparfait, mais qui va très loin, est mieux qu'un projet de loi qui n'a pas les appuis, donc qui ne sera pas... Pensez-vous que vous les avez laissés tomber? Vous avez-vous laissé tomber, M. Pablo Rodriguez? Bonjour. Bonjour. Vous allez bien? Oui, merci. Euh, Avez-vous l'impression que vous avez abandonné euh, les gens de police se souviennent de la mosquée de Québec qui demandaient, à qui on avait promis aussi, euh, vraiment euh, un durcissement des lois sur les armes d'assaut, et ce n'est pas le résultat qu'elles attendaient, ces personnes Bien, un durcissement des lois sur les armes d'assaut, c'est effectivement ce qu'on est en train de faire. On y va étape par étape. Euh, jamais aucun gouvernement dans l'histoire du pays n'a été aussi ambitieux en matière de contrôle des armes à feu. On sait que certains aimeraient aller encore plus loin. Les étapes suivantes suivront euh, probablement. Mais aujourd'hui, hier et au cours des derniers jours, on a vu à quel point le gouvernement canadien avait besoin et était capable d'avancer pour éviter que, comme ça s'est produit là, à Québec il y a quelques années, à la mosquée de Québec, que les armes d'assaut puissent être utilisées pour tuer le plus rapidement le plus de gens possible. Mais regardez, les armes SKS ne font pas partie de la liste et les armes qui sont déjà en circulation ne font pas partie de la liste. Je dire, là, aujourd'hui, l'un des arguments de Mme Provo, c'est qu'il pourrait avoir une autre tuerie. Là, malheureusement, on ne se le souhaite pas. Mais ce projet de loi ne fait rien en ce moment pour les armes qui sont déjà en circulation. Mais il y a trois choses que, qui, qui se font. La première, c'est que les 1500 et davantage de modèles qui ont été interdits en 2020, ces modèles continuent à être interdits et on va de l'avant pour le rachat de, de ces modèles. La deuxième chose, c'est qu'on a annoncé euh, hier qu'il allait avoir euh, un moratoire sur euh, tous les autres types euh, d'armes d'assaut qui pourraient être introduites. Ça veut dire que s'il y en a d'autres qui apparaissent sur le marché à partir de maintenant, de manière prospective, ils pourront, ces modèles pourront euh, faire partie là, des, des armes d'assaut euh, interdites. Et la troisième chose, c'est qu'on a annoncé qu'il y aurait un comité, qu'il y aurait un groupe de gens qui pourraient travailler pour voir de quelle manière, de manière rétrospective, les armes d'assaut existantes pourraient s'ajouter aux 1500 modèles qui ont été bannis euh, Déjà trois ans. Minister, two people who uh, left the drug pricing board are testifying today. One says they left because of your meddling in their process. Do you believe that you did anything wrong? The federal health minister needs to do two things. The first one, which happened on July the 1st, 2022, was to introduce new regulations to make sure that drug prices in Canada resemble more the type of drug prices that we see outside of Canada. So we have a new basket of countries which excludes the uh, United States and Switzerland, where prices of drugs are much too high, and include, uh, include countries where we believe drug prices uh, are better and more appropriately comparable to those that we want to see in Canada. The second thing is that the PMPRB needs to design regulations, not regulations, but guidelines to support regulations so that those regulations uh, put into place in, on July the 1st can be quickly leading to reductions in patented drug prices. And that's what we expect and no PMPRB will be doing over the next uh, few weeks and months. Um, your counterpart in, counterpart in Australia admitted his government was duped by the tobacco industry regarding vaping and they introduced strict measures to stop young people from vaping. Canada has similar youth vaping rates to Australia, so why isn't Canada doing more to protect our youth? We have, uh, A, we have already introduced uh, regulations a couple of months and years ago to strengthen uh, the ability to avoid youth and young Canadians having access to vaping products through um, regulations on packaging, on content of, of vaping products. We also said we would be moving forward with additional measures, and Minister Bennett and myself are reviewing those measures. Thank you. Thank you. How exactly do the amendments define an assault-style rifle? The, 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 the Bill C-21 now will have a technical definition of an, of an assault-style rifle as semi-automatic, um, uh, centerfire ammunition, um, um, but, but, but in any event, it, it, it provides a technical definition of what constitutes an assault rifle. And, and, and then there's obviously some work to do because there are some rifles that are, are not yet prohibited. We're not prohibited in the, in the um, order in council that we brought a, in, into place three years ago today or yesterday. Um, and, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons that, that an advisory, the firearms advisory, 
group has been reconstituted to, to look at those issues and how that should be, be dealt with going forward. How are you going to keep gun manufacturers from just tweaking the designs and the models to get around this definition? Well, and, and the onus will, will now shift, and I, I'm sure Mr. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, Marco? I, I think you're going to warn him. Yes, of course. That's, that's um, why. That's why. So I what is being done? What is being done to, to try to find the two firefighters that are missing? Well, first of all, my office has been, been in, in touch with uh, Minister Bondel uh, from, from the from the, the Quebec government. Um, they we are very closely working with the provincial authorities, and at the same time, the provincial authorities advise that they are currently the, the situation um, does not exceed their capacity to respond. There was a situation last night where the Canadian Armed Forces in Bagotville provided a helicopter to to assist in, in that, uh, the, that search for those two firefighters. Um, by the way, that's a very tragic set of circumstances, and we're all very concerned about, about the safety of those, those, those people, but also the ongoing situation that's taking place in the region. Uh, there are many people stranded in their homes. Uh, we will work very closely in support of the Quebec government, but they are leading on, on the response, and at the present time, they tell us they do not require any additional assistance from the federal government, but we remain, remain available sh uh, should that assistance be required. And when do you step up? Well, step up at their request. It is ultimately the responsibility of the provincial government, and they, I think they're managing it exceptionally well. And, and, and I, I've worked very closely with all the provincial and territorial governments, and certainly in the province of Quebec. Their ability to respond to such emergencies is, is quite robust. Uh, but at the same time, if it exceeds their capacity, then, then they will request our assistance, and we will come to their aid under their direction. Additionally, as a result of some of the damage that has occurred to both infrastructure and private residences, it is also available to the province to make application for um, funding through the disaster financial assistance arrangement. But, but it's early days for that. Right now, the, the, the primary focus is on the security of the people um, that are in the affected regions, their safety, and the immediate response to help them through this, this emergency. And then as we get into the work, the important work of recovery, uh, we'll be working very closely with the Quebec government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, sorry, I'm just having a little bit of trouble to, today. Do you, do you mind just uh, going a little bit slow for me? Oh, okay, okay. Ok, euh, il y a 1200% de hausse d'immigration clandestine à la frontière avec les états unis Est-ce que la décision de, de revoir l'entente avec les pays sûrs n'est pas en train de « backfire » Uh, C'est OK si je... Oui, je oui, OK, OK, oui. merci. Uh, my, my view is that the uh, changes that we've made to the Safe Third Country Agreement with the United States are the right path forward. We want to make sure that we continue to promote uh, regular migration. We know that Irregular migration, the trend globally is showing that we expect these numbers to increase around the world over the next generation as people become more mobile, as they face additional challenges. What we want to do is continue to work with our partners, not only to uh, implement rules that uh, uh, discourage irregular migration, but actually develop programs that promote regular pathways, including the 15,000 that we're working on with the United States and other measures around labor mobility that we're working on with partners right now. And sorry if I've missed something in your question. If, if you no, no, it's okay. Okay. When, when, we, when we receive these uh, new programs? Uh, I expect uh, very soon. I recently had a conversation with my counterpart, Secretary Mer America, just last week to discuss uh, where we're at in terms of the development. Uh, we expect uh, probably in the next um, uh, number of weeks we'll have more information to share. I don't have an exact date for you, uh, but the policy development is well underway to, uh, to move toward the, the next step to welcome more people. And in addition to creating pathways for people, we need to do more to build capacity in the region. I was very uh, pleased to see the United States made a decision to actually open processing facilities uh, in different locations uh, throughout the migration path from South America towards the United States uh, that's going to help them uh, not only uh, better monitor migration trends, but actually build capacity in countries that currently serve as thoroughfares for people who are passing through uh, South and Central America on their way to the United States and potentially to Canada. Uh, we're going to be looking at what additional investments we can make to build capacity in the region, both with state actors and with um, uh, civil society actors. Uh, so we can address uh, irregular migration at, at the source and build capacity in, in the region with our state partners as well. Minister, uh, two minutes, one. You might want to tuck in your... Oh, <laughs> thank there. you. Yeah, I'm a mess this morning. <laughs> hey. Not a problem. Yeah, yeah. I My wife will thank you on TV later. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, so, and then second of all, uh, with the strike that took place, have you been able to check in with the department, see what kind of backlog you have with immigration applications, and how do you plan to address that? Uh, so we were monitoring the impact of the uh, strike on our operations every day uh, over the course of the strike. And first, I want to say congratulations to both the union and to my colleague, Minister Forche, for securing a deal. Uh, my view is that the best agreements are reached at the table, and I'm, I'm glad to see that's happened here. Uh, we expect, uh, look, we can follow up with the exact number after, uh, but it's about 100,000 cases that were not processed during the work stoppage that we otherwise expected would have been. Uh, we've got, thankfully, uh, measures that we put in place initially to address the backlogs as the um, uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, came to an end in terms of the impact on border closures and movement of people, at least, not necessarily the public health impact. Uh, and we're going to continue to benefit from the higher productivity that we've achieved as a result of the resources we've added to the system, some policies that we've relaxed in order to uh, have our officers be able to do more with the, the time that they have, and the digital solutions that we've implemented. Uh, last year, we had about twice as many uh, final uh, decisions as the year prior. And with that enhanced productivity, I expect we're going to be able to get through these uh, the, these latest challenges as a result of the, the work stoppage. Uh, but my, my expectation is that we're going to be, um, over the course of the next few months, in a very good position. So two or three months or something, you might be able to get a handle on the backlog? Uh, yeah, hard to say with precision. Just to, to give you, and look, indulge me for a minute before I, I run in here to, to let you know where things are at. Uh, before the latest work stoppage, we'd actually gotten back to the pre-pandemic level of service standard for permanent residency for family reunification for federal economic streams through the express entry system. Uh, work permits and study permits were virtually back to within one or two days of the, uh, the pre-pandemic service level. Uh, the one mainstream where we still had some work left to do was on uh, temporary residency visas, trying to get people here for the tourism season, for weddings this summer, for family occasions, big events. Uh, we were on track some point in the summer uh, to get back to a 30-day standard. Uh, I expect we'll be delayed somewhat, uh, but over the next number of months, I expect we're going to be back to the pre-pandemic service levels if, if all goes well. Yeah, Is there anything new on Sudan to update in terms of visas? How many people have been able to come over to Canada? Anything there? So I met with leaders uh, from the Sudanese-Canadian community last night to discuss some of what we've done. What we're seeing right now is the urgent processing uh, that needed to be done to allow people to leave Sudan has been going very well. For example, all of the people who needed their proof of citizenship process, 100% had uh, been completed in a very quick turnaround. We've been processing as a priority every application in the system that has impacted a Sudanese national. Of course, we've got the announcement we made recently to extend the status for people who are here temporarily, in addition to the priority processing for people who are not yet here. The next step is going to uh, require us not only to process what travel documents people may need to leave Sudan or to come to Canada, uh, but to identify paths ways for people who've been impacted. We've seen estimates now uh, that there could be 800,000 people who are forced to flee. Uh, the uh, concerns that we heard last night uh, were to make sure that we, uh, we understand the impact on vulnerable people and particularly the impact on loved ones and family members of Sudanese Canadians who are here and are watching their loved ones uh, face uh, horrific circumstances. Uh, so the next uh, step that we'll be looking for will be identifying how we can create pathways for people who find themselves um, in, in need of protection with some kind of a tie to Canada, and that, that work's underway. And I expect as we continue to have conversations with the Canadian Sudanese community, uh, we'll have uh, more to say over the next number of weeks. And sorry, okay. Gabriel, what is the backlog now after the strike? Sorry. Uh, I, I don't have the exact number, but if we could send it after, that would be great. Thank you very much, and so much. thanks for your patience. Bon, euh, on verra parce que jusqu'à maintenant, il n'y a pas comme une, une gros backlog parce qu'on n'a pas reçu beaucoup d'applications durant à la grève. Mais ce que je peux assurer les Canadiens, c'est qu'on va appliquer les mêmes à stratégie qu'on a fait l'été dernier pour assurer que euh, les gens qui ont une voyage urgent soient triagés. Et je veux assurer les Canadiens aussi qu'ils qu ne doivent pas aller euh, au bureau de passeport euh, euh, avant qu'ils qu se ouvrent parce qu'on va faire le triage euh, dès que le bureau est, est ouvert et on va assurer que les Canadiens qui ont besoin de leur passeport d'une manière urgente le reçoivent à temps. In English, in English on the passport backlog, what is the passport backlog right now that you know of and how do you plan to get a hold of it? Sure. 
So uh, there isn't a significant backlog at this point in time because we did not receive many applications uh, during the general strike. So we received only about 20% of the normal applications that we would receive. Um, there are, of course, going to be some applications that are out of standard because of the strike. However, you know, we do feel we have the resources to catch up with that relatively quickly. I do want to assure Canadians um, that if they do have urgent travel, that we'll apply the same strategies that we applied last summer to make sure that we're triaging people based on date of travel. Are you one second, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna catch my breath, one second, because <laughs> I just walked upstairs. Um, but, um, and the other thing that I would say is Canadians do not need to go you know, early in the morning to get to a passport office because they will be triaged uh, based on date of travel and making sure that we get people their passports on time. Uh, we are expecting a number of applications to come in uh, over the next couple of days, people who didn't drop their passport applications off because of the general strike. And so we are prepared for that. I think, you know, particularly this week, Canadians can probably expect uh, longer lineups because of the two weeks of applications that didn't come in, but we will deal with them on an urgent basis. No, pas du tout. Alors, euh, nous pouvons avoir comme une, euh, euh, comment dire, une inventoire de à peu près 200 000 applications dans le système à chaque jour. Ça, c'est normal. Ça, c'est l'inventoire euh, normal. Euh, pendant la grève, on a eu à peu près 148 000 euh, dans le système. Euh, alors, on a il y a. Oui. Okay. Ouais. Alors, euh, il y a des capacités dans le système, mais euh, en même temps, nous savons que pendant cette semaine et peut-être la prochaine, on espère qu'on va avoir euh, plus de personnes qui font leur application euh, parce qu'ils n'ont pas pu le faire pendant les deux dernières semaines. Alors, dans les prochaines deux, trois, quatre semaines, ça se peut que euh, les applications soient un peu retardées, mais on euh, n'espère pas que ça va arriver comme l'année dernière. Vous aviez parlé de 85 000 euh, demandes par jour. Mm -hmm. euh, donc, pour l'instant, c'est moins... Euh, c'est moins pire reçu, que ce que oui, vous en on, on, a, on a reçu à peu près 20 de les applications normaux euh, pendant la grève, mais on sait qu'il y a euh, des personnes qui n'ont pas fait leur application qui vont le faire maintenant. Alors, nous avons les stratégies en place. Ça se peut que euh, les applications qui ne sont pas urgentes vont être un peu retardées, mais pas ce que nous avons vu l'année dernière. Les clauses linguistiques sont déjà dans les ententes. Oui, dans chaque euh, entente, il y a une clause linguistique. Ça, ça fait la base des de négociations que nous avons faites avec les provinces et territoires. Et c'est quelque chose qui est extrêmement important pour nous d'assurer que les communautés de langue officielle dans situation de minorité reçoivent les services de garde dans leur langue. Juste une question, pouvez-vous clarifier, vous avez dit qu'on en a reçu 148 000 pendant toute la grève, et ensuite vous avez parlé de 85 000. Je suis perdue. Euh, c'est les 85 000, c'est ce que nous recevons normalement par, euh, par semaine. Par semaine, et nous avons à peu près 148 000 dans l'inventoire actuellement. Ça, c'est ça, OK, dans l'inventaire. Ouais. Okay. Mais combien vous en avez reçu pendant la grève? À peu près 20 de ce que de nous recevons. 000, ouais. donc à peu près 20 000 par ouais. semaine. Ouais. Ouais. Thank you so much. Well, punitive. Uh, what, what do you mean? Or just like, um, like any like soccer, like soccer Canada's funding. Um, oh, okay, Canada. okay, yeah, we're working on the Soccer Canada file. Uh, we'll get back uh, about that in a few days.
uh, we're looking at ways that we can use our tools to uh, take a look at what's happening with uh, Soccer Canada. What, 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 what kind of tools? What about the letter that was written? Well, for example, the, the, the financial audit, uh, like we did with Hockey Canada. We have questions about the finances of uh, Soccer Canada. So you're going to order a financial audit? We're going to announce it when we're ready. Thank you. Uh, the letter that was written to you on behalf of I'm skaters sorry, I, I, I didn't hear the beginning of your question. There were figure skaters who wrote an open letter to you yeah. alleging yeah. abuse in British Columbia. I'm wondering what you plan on doing with that, if anything. Uh, well, it's a matter, it depends always uh, in which jurisdictions uh, things happen because uh, as we know, when it's uh, provincial sport organizations or community uh, organizations, then it's under the province's jurisdiction. Uh, but um, we're, you know, listening and following what's going on with the national team, and if we need to act, we will. Thank you. Dedicated government legislation, um, and you know that we're going to start work on on consultations now. I mean, I think it's very timely. You know, we'll build on 211, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I'm I'm determined to get due diligence in there. So where the build stands right now is it, it demands transparency, which is a very good thing. I want to take it another a next step, really, which is uh, uh, you know, what are you going to do about it? Right. That's basically what due diligence means. And also, I think like this is significant, right? Like it's it's pretty sweeping and significant. So it's. It's big for our supply chains, and uh, I think it deserves, you know, dedicated kind of government legislation, like and, and everything that comes with that, you know, proper proper consultation, meaningful consultation with stakeholders and, and the like. Um, that's not to say they, they did do some on, on S211, but you know, when you're doing dedicated government legislation, it takes it up a notch. I want to take it up a notch. Can you? Um do you think you can pass that before the end of this government? Do you think you can bring in legislation relatively quickly? I'm pretty determined to. Um, uh, it, it was a bit of a game changer for me to go to the International Labor Convention last year and um, and talk to people who've been affected by it. Uh, you know, it, 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 it girds you for uh, you know to take it to take on the battle. Although I don't think it's much of a battle. It's look, I think on all sides of, of the house, I think that there's an appetite for this. Um, I just want to make you know, and I work very hard to get uh, to work with other parties on legislation like this. So you know, I'm optimistic. I think within our own caucus, I know there's a great deal of enthusiasm, and I think there is in other caucuses as well. Uh, so I want to do it right, and I think it deserves it. John McKay says he's going to be on top of you, um, even as a member of your own party. No, oh, well, we listen. We we sit near each other, um, and and we talk all the time. Um, I was there, you know. Uh, to when, when we uh, when we were talking about it, when we opened debate on it, and you know, I've worked very very closely with John, and and he knows I'm I am you know, I mean this. Uh, I'm determined to do something about it, and we will build off the good work that he's done. Even this bill is transparency bill. Do you think a lot of companies are about to find out when they start to look even a little bit that there is child labor or forced labor in their supply chains? I'm not going to make any assumptions, but you know. It's there. There's no question. We're finding it in other similar jurisdictions as well. The United States is the European Union. Um, I want to learn from their experiences too. I want to look at model, what models work for them. But I think we have to take it with you know with the seriousness that you know this is this affects supply chains. This is you know this is our supply, and we are determined to eradicate it from our supply chain. Um, the Americans have been at it since 1938, if you can believe it. Um, and uh, you know what's worked for them, what doesn't work for them, what can we learn? Obviously particularly because they're our largest training partner and our biggest competitor any time that we can, you know, I've spoken to the, the special trade representative about this as well, any time that we can align ourselves more closely without giving up any of our autonomy or sovereignty, I want to do that. Um, you know, it makes, makes trading a lot easier, so I'm, I'm particularly keen to look at what, what's worked for them, same with the European Union, because they're like-minded and yeah. they hold similar values. One of the big concerns I know is cobalt and other critical minerals. Do you think there's an economic opportunity here for Canada because we have these minerals and the other places in the world they're coming from tend to use both child and slave labor? Yeah, I think that people are looking at these things with a more critical eye and, and, and you know, not just on, on critical minerals, but, uh, you know, even on energy sources that we use within our own country. I mean, investors are, you know, like, you know, we're looking at Volkswagen coming in and all that. They are certainly more keen to look at sources that are non-emitting or, you know, hydro, nuclear, these sorts of things. So we know that this is this is something that investors and other jurisdictions are looking a lot more closely at. Comme j'ai dit, je peux pas je peux pas dire 
euh, s'ils ont fait une demande, c'est une communication entre États. Euh, et comme j'ai dit, je ne peux rien dire sur le dossier parce que euh, dans le processus actuel, je pourrais jouer un rôle à la fin. Donc, Donc, à quel, à quel rôle on parle à ce niveau-là? Comme, comme vous savez, euh, à la fin d'un processus, ce sera le ministre de la Justice, euh, dans son rôle de ministre de la Justice, qui, qui euh, euh, effectivement effectue le, le, euh, le transfert. C'est vous qui de dire oui ou de dire non, finalement, à cette demande d'extradition? Comme j'ai dit, j'ai dé, décrit euh, mon rôle potentiel. C'est ça, je... mais votre rôle, juste le clarifier, c'est vous qui déterminez. Si jamais cette demande venait, c'est vous qui dites oui ou non. C'est ça votre rôle? Après un processus, oui. Et, et, et c'est la raison pour laquelle je ne peux rien dire. Ouais. Sur Mais, le fond, je ne peux rien dire. Euh, qu'est-ce qu que votre sont... bureau fait dans ce dossier-là? Pardon? En ce moment, qu'est-ce que votre bureau fait? Est-ce que vous étudiez je, même? Je, 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 vais, je, je vais rien dire, mais il y a un processus prévu Merci. par la loi. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez sur les congés de chasse pour les adopteurs? For you yes. about uh, the procurement we gave to Rochelle. Yes. You've seen the reports. Are you concerned about this? Well, I think that that's now under investigation, so we're going to leave it to see what the investigation reveals. But are you concerned about this? You have a big deal to send, uh, uh, to send, to send not tanks, but you know what I mean. Yes. In so look at we have uh, Helena Jasek, who's the minister now responsible. I know that she's going to do a fantastic job. But the main thing is that if concerns are raised, then of course we follow up those concerns with investigation. We don't avoid that. We look at it. So we'll see what it reveals. Is that going to have an impact on, on the, 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 the trucks we're sending to Ukraine? Because the production has been stopped So look now. at we can't, I'm not going to, you know, speculate as to what that investigation is going to reveal. But at the end of the day, we want to ensure that whenever we are procuring things, um, that, the, uh, that the, the rules are followed and that we are doing what is in the best interest of Canadians. Thank Merci. you.